thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, it's always a great chance to you know share your science, especially with um, you know the, the the public at large. Um, and I have a secondary motivation to be here. I'm renovating my house, so um, to, it's a complete mess. So any opportunity to leave and go, you know, someplace else, spend a night in a hotel room is fantastic. So I got to give a special props to my wife, who's staying there with our animals. And if you notice drywall dust on me, uh, I apologize. But yeah, it, it, it's just a mess. So um, uh, again, I'm I'm really grateful to Pop Tech and. <laughs> Uh, I didn't see what happened there. Um, I assume it was decent. If not, thank you. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the, the work that we've done um, in our lab in reprogramming bacteria to actually do what, what we think could be some pretty useful tasks. So um, bacteria actually are pretty impressive organisms. They can do some remarkable things. They can make stuff. They can talk to one another using uh, molecules, chemi chemicals as their language. They can recognize th the situation they're in. They can move towards things they like or away from the things they don't. And they can replicate every 20 minutes or so, which is a, a pretty impressive task. So, so how do they know how to do this? Well, they're programmed to do this. And they're programmed to do this um, in their genome. And Genomes are actually um, just a chemical depository of information, okay? So DNA, A, T's, G's, and C's, um, actually just stores information that actually programs these cells what to do. So, so when we're talking about information, it's, that it's worth considering how much information is it? You know, is this a big or a small number? Um, it turns out that you can actually store the entire bacterial genome. So you can program all these complicated tasks, moving and sensing and so on, and you can store it on one of these. Um, uh, you, you get chuckles because some people remember these and some people <laughs> don't. I, I, I teach young people, so you know, I got to tell them about um, the, you know, these. So you, you can actually you know, you store an entire E. coli genome on one of these or a whole bunch on, on, on one of these that, that you may have in your pockets. So um, over the past, um, say, uh, 60 years or so, molecular biologists have taught us how to go in. And essentially, with a little bit of cutting and pasting, we can alter the genomes of organisms. And we can do this um, quite well. Um, and over the past few years, in particular the past there we go. A um, few weeks, um, you, you've probably seen that Craig Venter and his colleagues have shown how you can actually start thinking about and actually doing synthesizing genomes, either de novo, so taking a genome from one organism and transplanting it into another, um, getting it to boot up much in the way that you would actually get a, a, a new operating system in, installed in your computer. So we're, we're getting to a point where it's expensive now, but as with anything the, the, the technological, the, the costs are decreasing. We can think about going to a computer, typing in a genome sequence, having machines synthesize it, and we can put it into a bug and have it boot up much in the way that you would have your computer boot up with the new operating system. And that's great. It's awesome. But then what? OK, so, so, so you can do that. What do you want to do? Well, like any computer, for example, we need to have a way to interact with it, right? We need a way to do input and output, which of course um, is typically a, you know, a computer or a keyboard or a monitor. Um, but we're not quite there that yet with cells. So we need to be able to interact with cells. And I was trained as a chemist. So what I'm particularly interested in is using small molecules. So what do I mean by that? I mean molecules that are relatively low molecular weight, things like aspirin, for example. So, so um, uh, low molecular weight molecules. We want to be able to use them to turn genes on or off within cells and ultimately program these cells to have predictable behaviors. So this transitions into an area that is often called synthetic biology. And some of you may have read about this. Um, there have been articles in the New Yorker and the Times and other places. So uh, they're all wrong. So let me just tell you what my, my thoughts are. Um, so click. So if you think about uh, areas of science, like physics and chemistry, they're the old ones, right? You know, I'm a chemist. I 
So um, they began by asking fundamental questions about how the world worked, right? So physics, physicists want to know why does the apple fall you know, down and not up? Chemists want to know why materials are brightly colored or heavy or caught fired and so on. Oh, I need to move. I'm, I'm getting, <laughs> now I need to move. My ex, sorry. Um, <laughs> I like to walk around. Um, so anyway, we did this for a long time. We got actually quite sophisticated at the, in, in, in these areas. So, so we could transition from an analytical mode of science, which is basically asking, you know, how do the world works? Then we could say new questions like, what can we do with it, right? So um, applied or synthetic physics gave us things like microwaves that you have in your kitchen or the laser that I'm holding right now. And applied chemistry um, is the basis of the modern ph pharmaceutical industry. What I would argue to you today is that biology is no different. It's just kind of late to the party. Okay, so these disciplines, um, the old guys have been built upon rigorous quantitative understanding over hundreds of years. Biology is relatively new, but I would argue that um, we know enough that we can actually start asking these synthetic questions or uh, applied questions. So the approach that we've been taking in our lab is that we want to be able to use any small molecule that we want to control any gene that we want and ultimately reprogram how cells behave. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories tonight. One is um, in this area of engineering bacteria to follow small molecules. So, so many of you may be aware that bacteria can actually rec recognize and respond to chemicals in their environment. Okay, So they move towards things they like, they move away from things they don't like, which obviously has some selective advantage. So, what we, we decided to do is we wanted to be able to reprogram bacteria to run towards molecules that we were interested in. Um, and th this would presumably be useful in areas like bioremediation. So can you get the bug to follow some nasty compound or alternatively select, uh, follow some compound, um, for example, being exuded by a tumor so that the cells could actually follow it and then chase it down. So turns out E. coli that's the organism we prefer to work with, actually already know how to do this. They can follow molecules they like, things like sugars and amino acids, the things they eat. And the way that they do that involves some proteins that are found at the surface of the cells called chemoreceptors. The molecules bind to those chemoreceptors and they are um, transduced to a change in cellular behavior through this flagellar motor, which is found at the ends of the cells. And when that motor rotates in a counterclockwise direction, the cells perform what's known as a run. And when the direction of rotation changes, the, cell, the, the motor rotates counterclockwise and the cells tumble for a fraction of a second. So if we just take a, a, a video here, these are E. coli. They're about um, a micron or two in length, so about a thousandth of a millimeter. And you'll see this guy here is tumbling and then he's going to start running and this guy is tumbling and he's going to run. And basically what they do is they migrate towards <laughs> compounds they like and they will continue in a gradient, okay? So if there's like high concentration of something they like, they'll keep going towards it. If they find themselves going away from something they like, they will tend to turn around and follow it, okay? So these, these organisms that you could program using, you know, basically a floppy disk um, can actually do some pretty sophisticated things. So, um, click. There we go. Okay, so how does all this work? Well, not, not to bore you, this has actually been well understood for over um, 40 years. It involves an alphabet soup of proteins that you don't need to know specifically, but it has been known for over 25 years that if you just take a single protein of E. coli and you remove it, it's called key Z, the cells don't run and tumble anymore. They actually just tumble in place. So these are the ones you saw before. Normally E. coli, they run, they tumble. Cells missing a single gene, they're, they're so they just tumble in place. So they can't run anymore, okay? Um, you don't need an expensive microscope to see this. If you take a Petri dish, and this is just a picture of one, um, they're not this big, they're kind of this big. Um, if you put cells at the center and let them grow, they will migrate out across the Petri dish. But if they're um, missing this gene, they don't um, move. So the idea is we want to get cells that behave like this to behave like that. So move in the presence of the molecule we want them to. Um, so how do we do that? 
Well, the way that we do that is we need to get the cells to recognize a molecule and we take advantage of a system um, that E. coli actually evolved probably three and a half billion years ago um, and it involves something known as a riboswitch. So what's a riboswitch? Well, a riboswitch is a sequence of RNA. So RNA is the cousin of DNA. Um, and RNA can actually bind to a small molecule using a region known as an aptamer, shown here. So the aptamer grabs onto its target and when it does, it enables a gene to be turned on or off. And this can occur through a variety of mechanisms, but what ties them all together is that RNA, small molecule, turns on expression of a gene, okay? So, these aptamers that recognize the small molecules can um, be discovered in the lab, and here's just an example of one. It was discovered um, a number of years ago, and what's remarkable about this aptamer, this, this, the numbers are not terribly important, is that this aptamer does not Bi it binds very well to a molecule known as theophylline. And if you are a tea drinker, you enjoy this every morning. Theophylline, uh, the French will call it tea, um, that is a compound prevalent in tea. Those of you that are coffee drinkers are, are more familiar with this molecule, which looks very similar to that one. Um, this RNA sequence does not bind this very well at all. In fact, it binds theophylline, which is found in tea, 10,000 fold. Uh, more tightly than caffeine, which um, is more prevalent in coffee. So a number of years ago, we showed that we could take this RNA sequence that recognizes these small molecules. We could um, <clears throat> put it in a gene, put it in bacteria, and what we found was that um, when we put these E. coli uh, on a Petri dish, either with no small molecule or which caffeine, which doesn't bind to this RNA, they, they looked like normal E. coli, they were called, sort of whitish gray, but the, the ones that had theophylline were blue, which is to say they turned on expression of that gene. Okay, so we can turn genes on and off, so can we do this and then make cells now follow that small molecule, in this case theophylline? Um, so, you know, that's the question, can we get the cells to run and can we get them to follow it? So, um, here's just a, a, a control experiment. If Normal cells don't care about the off or caffeine. This gets me up in the morning, but it does not make cells magically move, nor does theophylline. But if we add our switch, this riboswitch that we, we created, what you find is that caffeine doesn't trigger the switch, so the cells stay in the center of the plate, but theophylline, the cells migrate out across the plate. So of course, you know, we're, we're scientists, we want to be rigorously quantitative here, so we need some very expensive instrumentation to do that. Um, the instrumentation that we use, um, I actually used to joke this is only available in like one lab in Sweden, um, which I guess is kind of appropriate. Um, uh, it's a ruler. So you can measure, like with theophylline, you can measure that the cells move further, but with caffeine they don't move very far at all, which kind of makes sense, because theophylline kicks the switch, um, and then eventually at high concentrations the cells get sick, so they don't move very much. That, they're, they're sad. Um, so that was good. Um, so then we said, okay, can we get the cells to actually follow this molecule? Because that would be kind of cool. Um, click. Okay, so what we did is we set up an obstacle course. So we take a Petri dish, which again is kind of this big. And what we, meaning explicitly not me, but my graduate students <laughs> did, um, were to paint a solution of theophylline that goes this way. This is bug food, so this is kind of a control, and then caffeine. And what we did was we took cells and we plated them at the start of this obstacle course and we watched what they did. So, so we started with just normal E. coli and we knew they were going to move, so we made them green. You can do this with a fluorescent protein. And what you find is that those cells move out um, in a circle because they don't care about these molecules. So there's no asymmetry induced um, by the presence of these molecules. Um, if you take that key Z gene I told you about earlier and you delete it, um, we knew they weren't going to move, so we made them red and we put them there and they stayed there. You're all smart people, you come to PopTech. So um, if we put our switch into the mix, what you find is that the cells actually migrate and they make a right turn. So they're actually making decisions here. They're following one molecule that looks very similar to another, but they're picking it, okay? So they, they can recognize molecules they like and avoid things that they don't like. Um, so that was cool. Um, okay, so who cares about theophylline or caffeine if, you know, if you're a coffee drinker? Um, so we turned our attention to a new target, and that was this molecule shown here called atrazine. Um, 
I grew up in the Midwest, and for those of you that have, you've probably enjoyed this in your drinking water. There was an article in, your, in the Times last summer I, that titled, you know, how much weed killer is safe in your drinking water. Um, this molecule, apparently also, if you feed it to baby frogs, uh, it turns uh, females into males, uh, or males into females. I'm not sure which way it goes, but either way, it sounds very bad. Um, <laughs> And they spray a lot of this on corn crops. So if you spray 35,000 tons of something in, in the US, it's bound to get places that you don't want. Um, they banned it in Europe because it's kind of bad. Um, so yeah, this place, get, it gets in rivers, it gets in groundwater. So we'd like to be able to clean this up. So how do we do it? Well, we want to get cells that can recognize it. Um, so in order to do that, we need to get these aptamers that recognize atrazine. And Ideally, we want to get the cells that can follow it and degrade it. So we need to go on a fishing expedition. I actually looked on the internet to find like presidents fishing, so I figured in Washington. I, I've determined that uh, Democrats don't fish, or at least don't allow it to be photographed. Um, Sarah Palin and George Bush um, both fish, but I, I didn't want to go there. So here's Bart. You know, so, so basically what we do is we take a version of atrazine and we, 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 we attach it to some source and then we take a whole bunch of RNA sequences and we look for the ones that stick. Okay? And we ultimately were able to put those into these cells and what we do is we, we put them on a petri dish in the absence of atrazine and we look for the ones that don't move. Um, we do that again and then we add atrazine and we're going to look for the cells that now know how to move towards atrazine. And so this is actually a pretty easy experiment. You basically just look with your eyes, you pick the ones that move. Um, and at the end of the day, we find something that works. So in the absence of atrazine, these E. coli don't move. In the presence of atrazine, they start moving across the Petri dish. So that was good. The final question is, can we get the cells to actually eat it? Okay. So what we did was we actually um, we, we took a gene um, from an organism that um, had grown up in the presence of atrazine. So atrazine has been sprayed all over the world since uh, about 1960. Um, organisms have evolved to be able to um, catabolize it. So we took one of those genes and we put it into our organism. And basically what we're looking for is on a petri dish that has atrazine on it, which kind of looks like snow here, we're going to look for um, clearing zones around the cells, which basically shows that the cells are eating atrazine. Um, so we put those into our bugs. Um, first, if we don't put that in, what we find is that the cells um, move across the plate. They're, they're just kind of this green circle. Um, if we add the atrazine catabolizing gene, we see something different. We actually see that the cells move out and they migrate. And you see these dark rings, which indicate that the cells are actually eating the atrazine. Okay, so not only they're seeking it, they're actually destroying it, which is, which is kind of cool, and that's kind of what we hoped. Um, if you want to read about it, you can. But the bottom line is we can actually now take cells that otherwise wouldn't care about atrazine, get them to follow it, and then break it down. Okay, so just to sort of summarize what we, we, we talked about tonight, um, these riba switches that I talked about um, actually are very useful for controlling how cells behave. So I told you a couple of examples how they respond to molecules like theophylline or atrazine. But the take-home message is that you can actually get these to respond to a whole bunch of molecules, you know, sort of your favorite ones, to be able to turn on or turn off genes, which we think is actually pretty useful. So you can really program how cells behave. And then what that really does um, is open the door to um, this area of synthetic biology. So um, I guess I'll just conclude with, you know, sort of a, a question to all of you is, you know, what's next? So. Um, yeah, whenever you're at the, the sort of the, the start of a new scientific, you know, era, you want to ask questions like, what, you know, should we be doing? So, what kind of, you know, behaviors would we like to do? Should we get cells that follow and seek oil, or so on? Or um, what shouldn't we do? Which is, I think, is a equally and maybe a more important question. So, I'll just leave that for you to think about. Finally, let me just um, thank the folks that did the work. Um, uh, many, I've had many talented graduate students, Sean Desai and Sean Lynch, who developed some of our early riboswitches. Shana, who's shown there, um, uh, developed riboswitches that can make cells move. Joy, who's over there, um, 
taught those cells how to follow new small molecules, and a lot of folks have found it in their hearts and in their wallets to uh, fund the work that we do. And finally, I'd just like to thank um, PopTech for the inf in invitation and you for your kind attention. So I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much.